We're in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Find your Bibles. That's where we're going to sit the entire time. Ephesians chapter 6. About 10 years ago, our family was at Clear Lake. I don't know if you've ever been to Clear Lake, to Riding Mountain National Park, but Clear Lake is one of the nicest lakes in our area, and it is one of the coldest and deepest lakes in our area. We were there on a nice sunny summer day with a whole bunch of people, but the lake was freezing. It was terrible. And so, as I often did with the girls, I challenged them to do something. When, when they were younger, I'd often say something like, I'll give you 50 cents if you drink that whole thing of gravy. And they'd look at me and not do it and stuff. And so this day, I was actually being serious. I thought, well, if you're going to do this, I'll actually pay you more than 50 cents. I said, I'll give you $5 if you run from our picnic spot and dive into the lake. Because I didn't think they would, right? One of their uncles was standing there listening to this, and he said, I'll give you $5 if you don't run into the lake. He <laughs> wanted to protect them. And so the girls got together and had a little huddle, and then they came back, and I think, if I've got this right, I think Caitlin took off and dove in the lake, Megan stayed here, and they collected the money from both of us. <laughs> Pretty smart, right? In, in the spirit of being more generous, as I start my sermon, I like, I like audience participation as we begin. So in the spirit of being more generous, I have $20 here today. I have $20 that I will give you today if any one of you is carrying your passport this morning. Are you kidding? What? Well, there you go. You get 20 bucks. Norman and Isabel, you can fight over it by yourself lunch or something. I, I was a little bit worried that somebody was going to have their passport because of the wedding people. Oh, other people. You guys do too. What? Well, that's good. I thought somebody from the wedding party might have it because they're in Stoughton and then they're going to the States or something. I didn't think anybody carried their passport. That is interesting. Because here was going to be my point. I thought if no one was going to have it, I'd put my 20 bucks back in my pocket and be happy and go home again. And I was going to ask you, why aren't you carrying your passport? And the answer was going to be, because we don't need it. But apparently you carry it anyway. That's fine. That's good. Um, and my point, next point was going to be that if you'd known you were going to get 20 bucks, would you have brought your passport this morning? Maybe, right? If you knew you needed it, you might have brought it. But apparently, again, somebody bring it no matter what. Had I told you we were going to jump in my car and go to North Dakota for church this morning, every one of you would have brought your passport because you would have needed it. Right? All of us know that our passport is, a, is an important document. When I'm in the States, I have my passport on me all the time, right? I carry it all the time because you have to have it with you. It's really important when you need it. Most of you don't have your passport with you this morning because you don't think you need it right now. That one little simple principle is the principle of this whole sermon. It's not that passports aren't important. It's just that you likely don't think you need it. And I think in, in our spiritual walk, one of our biggest stumbling blocks is not that we don't have what we need or that we don't have things that are really, really important. We just are not sure we need them at this moment. And I'm going to try and convince you that we are, that we do, that the things we kind of neglect are not only important, but necessary right now. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 is going to try and change the thinking of his readers. He's going to try and change the thinking of the church in that place because lots of church people have an incorrect understanding of where they are. And I think it still happens today. You go talk to a bunch of people today and you ask them about church and you ask them about God, you ask them about the spiritual life, and they would tell you that spiritual life is like a day at the beach. Church should be fun. Church should be enjoyable. Church should be relaxing. Your spiritual life should just make you put your hands back behind your head and make you smile all the time and make you really glad. And the sun should be shining all the time. If you're walking with God, it should be easy. The sun should be shining and it should be wonderful. It should be really great. Your dad's going to take you for ice cream at the end of the day and it's just going to be a walk in the park. That's how a lot of people view Christianity. Do you think I'm wrong? 
I'm reading a book the other day. This guy said he became a Christian because he believes that God wants to bless us and make us happy. I hear that all the time. God wants to bless you and make you happy. Because it's a day at the beach. God is looking after you and everything's going to be fun and simple and there are no problems because you're walking with God. The problem with that, even though that's a popular way to think about how church and spiritual things ought to be, the problem with that is twofold. Number one, I think you'd have a hard time convincing the Apostle Paul that life is like a day at the beach. Where is he writing this letter from? Where does he write Ephesians from? Somebody tell me. A jail cell. He's been arrested for being a Christian. He's been arrested. He's been beaten up. He's been stoned. He's been thrown out of cities. He's been treated terribly by people. I think you'd have a hard time trying to convince a first century Christian who's watching their family getting dragged off and killed by the Romans that, uh, that their faith is a life at the beach. It's just easy. I think you'd have a real hard time convincing them of that. They wouldn't believe you. It's easier not to be a Christian. The other problem with this view of things is that when trouble actually does come, there's no place for it in this thinking. Right? If you think being a Christian is like a day at the beach and God's looking after me and everything's just ice cream and sunshine, when something really bad happens, it ruins your faith. And I've seen that happen, right? I've seen people who have come to church and then something horrible happens and their conclusion then is what? Their conclusion is there must not, there must not be a God. I must have been wrong. I thought it was supposed to be nice. I thought it was supposed to be, if I did the right things, everything should be easy. That's how I think. And when bad things come, it destroys their faith because they've got no place for it in their thinking about who God is. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is going to try and change this picture, not only for that church back then, but for every Christian down through the ages since then. Paul is going to tell you that your life isn't a day at the beach as a Christian. Your life as a Christian isn't a day at the beach, it's a battlefield. That's the imagery that Paul is going to use, and he uses it starting in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says if you saw your life correctly, you wouldn't think that it's a day at the beach where everything is simple and everything is wonderful. It is actually a battlefield. It is actually a battlefield and your soul and the souls of your kids and your eternal destiny is at stake here. And he uses battlefield image to describe what we are in. Now, the interesting thing, and the very good thing, and the thing that sometimes we pray about is that we don't know a lot about a battlefield these days, right? We don't really understand this language very personally. But if you were in Ukraine right now, and you preached this message and said, your life, your spiritual life is a war zone, they would understand what that meant. They would get it. Back in World War I and World War II, some of our old hymns, one of the ones we're going to sing at the end of today, they understood what, kind of, what a battle was about. To be honest, most of us have a day at the beach most of the time, right? We don't understand what it is to battle. We don't understand what it is to be in a fight. But Paul says, if you could pull back the curtain, and if you could look at your life right now, there is a war going on for your soul. And he says, it is a war that's not being fought in flesh and blood. You guys think the battle is that I shouldn't say bad words, or I shouldn't watch bad things, I shouldn't go. That's not the real battle. The real battle is the one you can't even see that's being fought between, um, against authorities and powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil. In the heavenly realms, he says, there's a spiritual battle going on here and you are part of it whether you see it or not. Now, our good 21st century Christian scientific mind goes, bah, that's ridiculous. 
What are you talking about? Angels and demons and devils and fights and blah, blah, blah. But you know it's true. Every single person in this world knows that evil is a real thing. Even if they don't believe in God or spiritual things, they know that evil is real. The best literature that's ever been written has been about the struggle of good versus evil all the way through. We understand there's a battle there. There's a reason horror movies are made. When I was a kid, I watched horror movies like crazy. I had a buddy who loved horror movies. We watched a lot of them. Horror movies still get made because people understand there's an evil presence around. That's not fake. They, they're trying to figure out what's going on here. They're acknowledging what's actually true. And as I say lots of times, you don't have to read the news very long to understand that evil is a presence in the world. Paul says, if you could actually see your life, you would understand that this isn't just about going to church. It's not just about singing a song you like or don't like. This is about your soul, and there's a battle going on, and you're in the middle of a war. You're in the middle of a battle. And so the goal is to get to the end. The goal is to survive. The goal is to get through the battle. Now, to be clear, let's make sure we put a little stake right here. To be clear, the battle has been won, right? Jesus has won the war. It's not, a, it's not a yin and yang sort of thing where it might go one way or the other. It's half and half, evil and good. No, no, no. Jesus has won the war. At the end of time, there's a clear winner. It's Jesus and his followers. The only part of the war that's still at question is which side are you on? Where are you going to stand? But if you could see your life, Paul says, the battle is raging. The battle is on. Are you standing with good or evil? Are you going home or are you going to be separated from God? That's the situation. That's the question. Now, the other thing we need to know about this is not only are we in a battle, but the good news is, is that we've got some help. We've got some protection. We've got some stuff that we can use. And so when Paul started this discussion about the battle, he started it by saying, put on the full armor of God. Paul is in prison. He is chained to a Roman guard. He's seeing Roman guards walking around. And so he uses his Roman guard as a template to talk to Christians about what they have as armor, what they have to help them in their battle. And that's the next part of the scripture we want to look at. The next few verses, he says, you're in a battle. This is really serious. This isn't a joke. Verse 13, he says, therefore, because you're in the battle, therefore is a connecting word, because you're in a battle, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, you may be able to take your, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, his concern is that they can stand. His concern is that they get through the battle. How are you going to do that? If you're going to get through the battle, verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Paul says, if you really know you're in a battle, here's your stuff you can use. I want you to be people who look at things like truth and righteousness and the gospel and faith and salvation and the Word of God and prayer. These are your armaments. These are the things that will help you get through the battle. This is your protection. Now, sometimes when I've heard this preach, people make a big deal about where he put each piece. For example, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. And they say, well, righteousness guards your heart. And uh, the helmet of salvation. And you know the truth and all these things. I don't think he really cares about where all these pieces go. He's looking at his little Roman friend and he's using him as a template. But he's really just saying, these are the tools you have. These are the things you have to get through the battle you are in. 
Truth will help you get through the spiritual battle. If you know what is true and if you talk about what's true and if you hold on to what is true, you will get through. Righteousness and doing the right thing will help you find your way through the battle you are in. The gospel and faith and salvation and reading God's word and praying will help you get through the battle. That's what he's trying to say. These are the things you have on your side. These are the things that are helpful to you. And here's my point. I think we neglect these things, not because we don't think they're important, but because we don't understand where we are. I think we struggle with prayer, not because we don't think prayer is important, but because we don't think we're in a battle. I think we struggle with reading the Word of God, not because we don't think the Word is important, but because we don't understand that we need it. That, that we actually have to use it if we're going to get through. Everybody would say everything on that list is important. We're just not convinced it's really necessary for us at the moment. But it is, Paul says, if you understand that you are in a battle. It is not optional at this point. If you know you're in a battle, this stuff isn't optional. It's necessary. I said we don't understand battle imagery that well. So let's change it to something we do understand. Unfortunately, in about three or four months, it's going to be 40 below outside. If you had to walk from here to Canadian Tire... And yet it was 40 below and the storm was blowing and the wind was going and it's snowing hard. How would you walk out this door? If I handed you a winter coat and a toque and some mitts and some winter boots and some winter pants and said, you've got to walk from here to Canadian Tire, would you walk out the door without them? Of course you wouldn't. You'd put on everything you had so you'd still be warm when you got there. Would you just put on one thing? Would you be like the teenagers that they, uh, that, well, when I was a teenager, I did this too. Would you put your toque on and wear a really light coat so you'd look cool? Because looking cool is really important rather than being, would you just put on your toque and try it? No, you wouldn't. You'd put on everything you could because you knew you needed it. Again, I don't think the church struggles with these things because we don't think they're important. I think we struggle with these things and we leave our Bibles on the table and we don't think about any of these things because we don't think it's necessary. We don't think we need them right now. But the fact of the matter is we do. And the fact of the matter is you don't know when you need each piece, so you better keep each piece with you. About 15 years ago, I was standing in a and I was having coffee with a bunch of people in front of me, was one of the city police officers. And I noticed the city police officer was wearing his bulletproof vest that morning. I'd actually seen that for about a week. They, every time I saw a cop, he was wearing his bulletproof vest. So I tapped this guy on the shoulder and said, why is it that you guys have started wearing your bulletproof vests? And he said, well, the chief decided that if you ever need it, it does more good when it's on you than when it's in the locker back at the police station. You don't know when you're going to need it, so you better wear it every single minute because you never know when you're going to need it. You keep it with you, you put it on because you might need it. And if it's sitting at the station, it's useless. When Paul talks about the full armor of God, I've heard lots of sermons about make these things important. These things are important. We've got to make sure we know that they're necessary. We've got to know that our protection, as he said in this passage, is in the Lord, from the Lord, with the Lord. Those are the phrases he uses over and over again. Again, I get asked lots of times to teach classes about prayer. I don't think I should teach a class about prayer anymore. I think I should teach a class about where you are. And once you're there, you would start praying. And again, you know that because as soon as somebody has a health scare, as soon as something happens, people start praying. We understand these things are important. We need to understand we need them right now. All of you know that I have a motorcycle. In, uh, in, in the motorcycle world, there is a word that people use to talk about certain things. There's lots of language in the motorcycle world. In the motorcycle world, there's a word people say, at gat. At-gat is a word that people make up. At-gat means all the gear 
all the time. If you're an at-gat sort of rider, you wear your coat all the time. You wear your helmet everywhere you go. You wear your gloves everywhere you go. You wear your riding pants and your boots all the time. I'm an at-gat guy. All the gear, all the time. When it's 45 degrees outside, I still have my leather coat on, I still wear my gloves, I still wear my helmet, I still wear my riding pants, I don't ride in shorts, because I might wipe out. And you never know when you're gonna wipe out. I wear all the gear, all the time. And I think for Christian people, this needs to be our attitude. I need all the gear, all the time. Because just praying once in a while, maybe reading the word sometimes, maybe thinking about righteousness once in a while, or that's not enough. All the gear, all the time. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying, because we never know when we're going to need it. Again, every single one of us prays, every single one of us reads the word, every single one of us thinks about salvation once in a while. All these common things that we sometimes just think about and pass over become really, really important when you understand where you actually are. Paul says you're not at the beach. You're not supposed to be just laying around. This isn't easy. This is super important. This is life or death, heaven and hell. These are the things that can help you. Once we understand where we really are, then we will understand the importance of what we have. If you know you need it, you'll bring it with you. If you needed your passport this morning, it would have been here. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, the armor of God is not optional for really spiritual people. That's what I used to think. People who are really super spiritual read their word and pray all the time. This isn't something for the super spiritual. This is for everybody. Because everybody's in the battle. When we understand where we are, we will understand what we need. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, I want you to be on your guard. I want you to stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Those things we do. Because what we do is important. Because this isn't just about church. This is about eternity. Brothers and sisters, when we see where we are, we'll know what we need. Every single week, we stop in the middle of our service, and every single week, we remind ourselves of where we are and where we're going and what's really important. Every single week, we remind ourselves of what we really need, not what we're chasing after all the other days of the week most of the time. Every single week, we stop and remember the cross, because it reminds us that the battle was on, the battle's been won, and we need to be at the end of the battle. If you take your communion stuff, we'll remember Christ's death the first time. This morning we have the privilege of meeting around the Lord's table together. We should be so thankful for all that Christ has done for us, especially going to the cross. As we prepare our thoughts and think about what Christ has really done, I would like to read a passage of Paul writing the letter to the Colossians who describes Christ. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell on him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body 
He dealt to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Let's go to God. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the blessing that is ours this morning. We are thankful, Father, for this time that we remember the body of Jesus. We are thankful for this, Lord, because it reminds us of the body that hung on that cruel cross for us. Grant us to keep our faith, for we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't pray and read the Word of God and go to church because it makes God happy with us. That's not why we do it. We do it because it strengthens us for the battle that we're in. We do it because it brings God's strength into our situation and into the lives of others. May we put on the armor of God this week so that we find His strength and so that we're there at the end of the battle. We'll see you next week. <laughs>